So the Chesapeake Bay region is an environmentally sensitive area in the, in the East Coast, and it's getting a lot of attention, it's a lot of frustration, really. But a lot's been done over the past 20, 30 years uh, with relatively limited success, I guess, in really improving the nutrient loading to the Bay. And agriculture does, agriculture does take credit for a lot of the nutrient loading. 57% of the nitrogen, 45% of the phosphorus, and 70% of the sediment <clears throat> going into the bay is supposed to have come from agriculture. A lot of this actually comes down uh, the Susquehanna River, so the major river through central Pennsylvania. And it's, uh, there's agriculture all along the river, really, but particularly in southern Pennsylvania, there's some counties here, Lancaster, Lebanon, and Dauphin County, which are some of the richest agricultural land in, in Pennsylvania and really in the country. It's a heavy agricultural area. And this is the uh, site where we've kind of focused our attention right now to kind of look at what we can do to uh, reduce nutrient loading. There have been a number of studies done uh, to kind of qualitatively evaluate and, and rank uh, different management practices that could be used to reduce the nutrient loading. This shows some lists of things that have come up with. What we're trying to do is follow along the same kind of lines as this list, but do a more quantitative analysis of some of these practices. So our objective is to simulate representative farming systems for this region to determine the environmental benefit of many of these practices and determine their economic value to the producer. So we've set up three representative farms you know, to represent sort of the agriculture in this region. We have a crop farm, what we're going to call a contemporary dairy farm, and then the third one, which is very popular in this region, it's an old, old Amish dairy farm. And if you're not familiar with the Amish, uh, they're smaller farms, primarily dairy, and they're uh, in some cases, they use the latest technology, but in case, some cases, they don't, OK? Uh, they don't use tractors, for example. All their mobile equipment has to be horse-drawn. So uh, the crop farm had 1,000 acres and a four-year rotation of corn, soybeans, and winter wheat, uh, primarily a no-till system. No-till is actually pretty well adopted in this region. Contemporary day, uh, 100 cows on 300 acres, eight-year rotation, corn grain, corn silage, winter wheat, Four years of alfalfa hay. Again, uh, a lot of no-till being used here. For the Amish farm, smaller, 50 cows, which is pretty good size Amish farm, really. Um, on 60 acres, pretty high animal density, eight-year rotation of uh, corn silage and alfalfa. In general, the Amish would use a more conventional uh, multi-pass tillage system. And again, it's all horse-drawn equipment. So these are the management practices we wanted to look at. Uh, use of different levels of tillage, strip cropping, different uh, uh, amounts of manure storage. Under nutrient management, we were looking at uh, reallocation of the manure within the farm to see if we could better match the nutrients uh, availability to the crop. We were also looking at uh, broadcast application versus uh, broadcast plus immediate incorporation. Some of the cropping strategies, uh, particularly for the Amish farm, we want to look at using more grazing. Uh, we also, on all the farms, look at use of cover crops and double cropping systems with winter small grains uh, along with soybeans or corn. Did some analysis of uh, use of grass buffer strips. In the last box out here, we the base analysis was actually done with the diets formulated to just meet the, the nutrient requirements of the animal as far as protein and phosphorus. Well, typically, the farms are overfeeding these. So we also ran that analysis to look at the impact of, of overfeeding protein and phosphorus. So this analysis was done with uh, the integrated farm system model. This is a simulation model, a process-based simulation model of the whole farm. So we're simulating all the major processes here as illustrated normally on a daily time step, following them through time as they're influenced by weather. Uh, predicting the overall performance of the farm, 
the nutrient losses from the farm, both water and air. Uh, we normally simulate over 25 years to get sort of a long-term look at the performance, environmental impacts, and the economics of the farm operation. If you want to know any more about this model, I'll be giving you another talk at 4.30 that goes into the modeling in more detail. So one of the major challenges in this particular study was to use our model uh, to represent these Amish dairy farms. Um, this is the first time we've tried to apply it to this type of farm. Uh, more conventionally, I mean, we're going to be using tractors and so forth. So we had to really substitute tractors for horse teams and uh, that sort of thing, smaller equipment. So it, it took some major reparameterization of the model to accommodate that. In addition to using the horses, uh, of course, that was saving fuel and energy, but that increased, they had to be fed. So that was another demand on the farm, and that we had to handle their nutrients as well. The operations were slower, more labor intensive. So all of that was incorporated into the model. So first we look at sort of the baseline farms and then look at how some of the management changes affected those. This shows some comparisons that we did just to kind of verify that we were uh, doing the right thing. Uh, this is uh, the crop yields predicted for the crop farm and the uh, dairy farm. Shows the yield and in parentheses, this is a standard deviation of the yield across the, the 25 years. This compares to the National Ag Statistics reported yields for these counties and also some reported yields by the district conservation uh, staff in that region. This is a look at some of the timing of operations. Again, what we simulated, what the model predicted uh, versus what was reported for this area. So you can see we did a pretty good job of, uh, at least the model tended to agree with what they would say as the typical planning and harvesting dates and that sort of thing. So uh, for the Amish dairy, one of the things that we compared was the uh, estimated amount of uh, labor that went into the various operations versus what we ended up predicting with our adjusted model. So with those kind of comparisons, we felt we were representing the performance of the farms. Uh, as far as the nutrient loading that's predicted by the farms, that's a little harder to do. Uh, there's just not much data out there, really hard data to compare to. What we did compare to here are some simulated or model predictions uh, from the Sparrow model, which is, which is a, a model that's used a lot to represent uh, sub-watersheds within the, the overall Chesapeake Bay watershed. But this looks at uh, what that model predicts for phosphorus runoff and, and sediment uh, runoff from the farm versus what we're predicting. So again, it's pretty close. Uh, you can see that maybe the numbers here are a little higher. Uh, one of the maybe reasons for that, we're sort of predicting edge of farm losses, whereas the watershed model is looking more at the, the larger watershed. So we would expect some difference. So with that, we can look at some of the uh, performance results and economics. I'm not going to go through all the different uh, data at this point, but give you enough to kind of give you a feel for, for what the model is generating and what we're finding. Uh, first is for the crop farm. Uh, this is the different levels of tillage. Now the base farm, if you remember, primarily used a no-till system. So this just illustrates that if we went back to more, uh, more tillage operations, how much impact that it could have when phosphorus went off. Some of the things that were beneficial uh, was the use of strip comp cropping, no-till on all of the land, which in this case we weren't, weren't on all of it as the base farm. Uh, double cropping and uh, some improvement in nutrient management, as well as using a cover crop across the whole farm. So you can see that there's, these aren't big changes, but there are some improvement. This is sediment run uh, phosphorus runoff. If we look at sediment runoff, it falls pretty much the same kind of trend. So look at what we're predicting for nitrogen leaching. Uh, the improvement in nutrient management, this was again reallocating some of the manure so we're making better use of the nutrients, use of double cropping, cover cropping, 
um, the, the things that were really reducing the, the nitrate leaching in the groundwater. And the last one shows the net return of profitability of the farm. Uh, the only thing here that's really coming out is the use of double cropping, that it could uh, significantly increase the profitability of the farm. Uh, cover cropping could maybe be about break even, as well as the nutrient management. Of course, increasing tillage and the use of grass buffers were uh, not economically profitable. If we look at the dairy farm, um, again, if we look at increasing in the amount of tillage, of course, that's going to increase the phosphorus runoff. Use of strip cropping here did create a, a small reduction uh, in sediment runoff, a lot of the same trends. Here we did find the grass buffer that showed up as just a little bit of benefit, along with cover cropping and double cropping. In terms of nitrogen uh, volatilization now, uh, this would be from the ammonia volatilization from the manure on the farm. Uh, of course, increasing the protein in the diet was increasing the amount of volatilization that occurred. Using a 12-month storage was increasing volatilization from longer-term storage. Use of double crop and cover crop were also affecting volatilization a little bit, uh, primarily because of its interaction with manure spreading. Um, manure incorporation and a four-month manure storage as compared to a six-month, I think, which was the baseline, uh, both had some improvement in redu reducing volatilization. In terms of nitrogen leaching, cover crop, uh, the improvement in nutrient management, double crop, and 12-month storage all uh, uh, provided a significant reduction in the amount of leaching that would occur. And the net return, uh, the only thing that really has much benefit is the improvement in, in nutrient management, uh, getting reallocation of the manure nutrients. Really wasn't of much cost to the producer to just get them in the right place at the right time. Um, other things, pretty much everything, double crop, conventional tillage, their grass buffer, all these things would reduce the profitability of the operation. For the Amish dairy, uh, again, we show here the higher feeding of phosphorus, of course, is going to increase the phosphorus runoff a little bit. Double cropping had a small increase. Pretty substantial decreases in phosphorus runoff with the use of strip cropping, more pasture, and reduced tillage operations. Much the same trend for sediment runoff. Uh, most everything we looked at for the Amish dairy would increase the nitrogen volatilization substantially. Exceptions would be uh, the double cropping and the improvement in nutrient management had some small improvements. And uh, also, um, the use of manure storage here on the Amish farms, which we normally not use manure storage, uh, and the double cropping provided reductions in, in nitrogen leaching. And overall, in the net return of profitability of these Amish farms, there wasn't a chance for much improvement. Double cropping was pretty much a break even. Everything else was somewhat of a loss in profitability. So just to summarize, the crop for the crop farm, what we're kind of finding is that cover cropping and double cropping, versus reduced tillage, strip cropping, grass buffers, all provided some environmental benefit. Similar for the contemporary dairy farm, along with improvement in some of their uh, nutrient management. For the Amish dairy, uh, reduced tillage, of course, would help if they could do it and with their uh, way of practices. Uh, increasing the amount of pasturing, strip cropping, and cover cropping all provided environmental benefit. In terms of economic benefit, though, uh, cover cropping and double cropping uh, on the uh, crop farm and further reduction in tillage practices all did have some economic uh, benefit for the, for the crop farm and for the contemporary dairy a little better nutrient management planning and uh, reduced manure storage time uh, showed some profit. For the Amish dairy, double cropping and reduction in tillage showed some prop potential profitability. This would probably be difficult for them to do 
with their practices. But one of the things that's happening in this area is increased use of custom operations. In many cases, they are allowed to pay somebody else to come in and do it for them. So under that type of scenario, uh, things like double cropping and, and other uh, alternative tillage practices become more practical for them. I won't go through the details of this, but just to show you some other examples of what we can get out of this model. We are simulating over 25 years and looking at each individual year and its impact. So we're not only getting a mean as we've been looking at, we're getting a distribution around each of these uh, impacts as, as we, we see them. So you can see some of them, uh, really probably in general, the higher the mean value, the more spread there is from year to year, the more variance there is. So this is a look at nitrogen loss, phosphorus loss, and, and farm profit. And one other thing that we're now trying to quantify is the overall cost effectiveness of these. So looking at the amount of phosphorus loss that you are saving uh, versus the cost of doing that. So that's what's being shown here, the cost effectiveness in dollars per gram of phosphorus loss. And again, we got distributions uh, for these different scenarios as we look at them over time. So some years we get a lot of benefit, other years maybe break even, and some years maybe it's a loss. So in conclusion, uh, I guess it's not new, but uh, most management practices do have trade-offs. As we've seen, you know, if you do something to reduce uh, phosphorus loss, you may be increasing some nitrogen loss, or if we do reduce volatilization of nitrogen, we're going to increase leaching of nitrogen, those kind of, of things. So we have to start thinking about how do we really integrate these numbers into something that's really more meaningful overall. And that's going to be very dependent on the, on the farm operations, the type of strategies used, the climate, and the location, that sort of thing. You know, in the Chesapeake Bay, all the interest really at this point in time is pretty much on water quality, uh, not so much on air quality. So that we might be sacrificing air quality in some cases to re improve water quality. So overall, I guess one of the things that, that is coming out is that this practice of double cropping a winter, a small grain crop uh, with corn or soybeans in this region uh, looks pretty promising. And it actually is a very rapidly growing strategy in this region at this time. But I guess with our really warming climate, along with uh, a lot of use of no-till, they can turn these crops over very quickly and uh, they are finding it to be feasible and, uh, and economically viable for them to do it. See, some other low-hanging fruit, I guess what we found was that it appears that if we can do a little better job maybe of matching the, the nutrients available uh, to the nutrients needed by the crop, and, and that comes at a very low cost to them. So that's something that, that really should be focused on immediately. As far as the overall application of these results, uh, we hope that this kind of quantification can provide a uh, basis for better recommendations uh, by the conservation district officials and policymakers and so forth. And, and hopefully some of these that show some more economic value can, be, can encourage producers in this region to move in that direction. Thank you.